morning. All right, let's be turning to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. I want to read the, the text that we often refer to as the Great Commission of our Lord to his church. That's Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now, this is the commission of our Lord to his church to preach the gospel of God concerning our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to speak to you this morning about baptism in particular. And what our Lord tells his church is to preach Christ, teach them of what I have accomplished for my people. And in looking to Christ, in declaring Christ, in upholding Christ, baptism will follow. It's a fruit that will follow. We're not to preach and tell people what to do and what fruits they're to produce and what, what actions they're to take. We're to declare the Lord Jesus Christ and in exalting him, he draws all men as it pleases him to himself and the fruits will follow. He will reveal the work of his grace, the work of his spirit in his children. And when we preach Christ, believers will be baptized. They'll ask to be baptized. They'll want to be baptized. Let me show you an example of this in scripture. You can see this in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. We'll begin in verse 32 there, but while you're turning, the Spirit told Philip to go from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. He told him, I want you to go out there. He goes out there to Gaza, and he sees an Ethiopian in a chariot a eunuch, an Ethiopian eunuch in a chariot, and as he comes up, he sees, he hears that he's reading the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 53, to be exact, but it says the place of the scripture, verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his, humili in his humiliation, that is, in his flesh, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And Philip asked this man, do you understand what you read? And he said, how can I except some man teach me? And he asked Philip, who is the prophet writing of? Who, of whom is he speaking, of himself or another? And it says, verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He preached Christ crucified from that text. He preached Christ crucified. He declared Christ, the sacrificial lamb, sent to the Father to lay down his life as the substitute of his people to, to bear their sins, their iniquity their transgressions and to pay the price that we owed unto God. He died our death and he declared Christ the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. That is, there is no other Savior. There is but one Savior, one salvation of the Father. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to him. Look to him. The 
Father was pleased to raise him from the dead, declaring that he is well pleased in his Son and all who come to him in Christ. And it says, verse 36, as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. There in the desert, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He believed the gospel that Philip preached concerning Jesus Christ, that he is the Savior. He is the very salvation of God for his people. And he heard him speak of Christ, and he heard him speak of baptism, and he wanted to be baptized. He asked to be baptized in the preaching of Christ crucified. And so baptism here we see is for believers. It is for those who profess Christ, for those who have heard what Christ has accomplished for his people, and they believe, they believe. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Father's salvation for his people, the one who redeemed his people from their sins, the one who justifies his people, making them righteous by his own righteousness. Baptism does not save the sinner. That's not why believers are baptized. It's not our salvation. Jesus Christ saves sinners. Christ alone saves sinners. He's the salvation of God. Baptism is a symbol. It's a symbol that testifies of the, the sinner's faith, that they've heard that word, that they believe Christ is their all. He is their salvation. And that's why they're coming to be baptized. It's a symbol of the faith which God has wrought in their hearts. And therefore, they're baptized. It's a testimony of the faith that God has put in you that looks not to self, not to our works, not to what we have or have not done, but looks to the Lord Jesus Christ alone. So baptism, it's the believer's confession of faith in Christ. Baptism gives us a picture of the gospel. It's very symbolical of the spiritual work that God has wrought in the heart of his child. It reveals, it manifests the faith that we have in Christ. That it's not my works, it's not what I do. And so symbolically it shows what Christ has accomplished for his child. And we can view this symbolism over in Romans chapter 6. Turn with me now to Romans 6. We're going to pick up in verse 3. I want us to understand that our salvation, our hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not what we do. It's not in our baptism. Baptism is a fruit, the result of our faith. Obedience to Christ follows that work of salvation that he works in his child. So Romans 6, 3, Paul says, Know ye not? that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now first, before we look at that symbolism, let me just point out there that Paul said we were baptized into Christ. Into Christ. We're entirely immersed into Christ. Paul wrote in, to the Ephesians in Ephesians 1.4, he said, for God hath chosen us in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. In Christ, in love. There's no part of the child of God that remains outside of Christ. There's no part of the child of God that remains outside of the love of God. We're not sprinkled with Christ. We're not sprinkled with God's love. We're immersed in it. We're immersed entirely in the Lord Jesus Christ. He completes, he's the fullness. We're entirely 
in him and entirely in his love covered in his love in in christ we're plunged the hymn writer <clears throat> speaks of that fountain of blood which the sinner is plunged beneath plunged below that blood of christ that blood of christ covering us washing away all our sins we're covered immersed in the lord jesus christ and that's what baptism is it's an immersion an immersion into the water we're immersed in the water completely surrounded in it just as we are completely immersed in the lord jesus christ christ is all and we're nothing apart from him and god has put us in him immersed us in the lord jesus christ some people speak of of immersion as a mode of baptism it's one form as opposed to another of baptism but being honest that's ignorance that's actually ignorance willful or otherwise it's ignorance because the word baptism means immersion immersion isn't a mode of immersion you wouldn't say that you wouldn't say that that well I choose to immerse by immersion as opposed to immerse by sprinkling. No, immersion is immersion. It is that very, very thing. Baptism is immersion, just like we've been immersed in Christ, put entirely in Christ, and nothing remains outside of Christ. We're all in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're his body. But further to this symbolism of baptism, Paul says it pictures our death, that we are dead with the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul boasted when writing to the Galatians, he said, for I am crucified with Christ. And that is true of every believer. You can say, I'm crucified with Christ. I've been put to death with the Lord Jesus Christ. When he died, I died with him. I was in him. He held me. He carried me. He brought me through the veil in his own body. Paul says a little further about this in Romans 6, Romans 6, verse 6, saying, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now, we looked at what that means, the body of sin being destroyed. We looked at that not too long ago when we were in Colossians chapter 2, verse 20, to the end of the chapter. And I think I called it instructions to the new man. But we saw there just a few things. First, that the body of sin has no more power over the child of God. The body of sin, our bodies have many members. Well, in like manner, so the body of sin has many members, many facets to it, many different things about it. And one thing it no longer has over the child of God is it has no authority over you. You're not under its rule. You're not forced to obey it. You that believe the Lord Jesus Christ, your accuser, your fear monger, your law monger has no more authority over you. He has nothing to say to you. He's not the voice of your husband. Christ is. Hear him. Hear the Lord Jesus Christ, and don't be moved with fear and terror to try and obtain salvation of your God. Christ has obtained your salvation. He's delivered you from death, and he speaks comforting words of joy and peace into the heart of his child. God is satisfied with you in, immersed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Second, that veil of nature's death has been removed meaning that you've been circumcised in the heart by the Lord Jesus Christ. By nature, we're born with a thick veil of skin, as it were, that blinds us, that covers our heart, that keeps us from hearing our God and believing the, the truth and the salvation of God. By thinking that we earn God's favor, that we work for God's favor, that we work for his inheritance and his, and his blessings. That's what the natural man thinks because there's a thick veil of flesh, as it were, on our hearts that keeps us in darkness. 
that keeps us from understanding and knowing the true and living God, that keeps us in enmity. But when Christ died, that body of sin was put to death. And Christ, when he brings this salvation to your heart, cuts away that veil of flesh, removing it and throwing it away so that now you see. Now you hear. Now you see the light of God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you believe him. And you come in faith, not in works. You come trusting the Lord, not trusting what you have or have not done. And third, another thing we see is that having life by the regeneration work of the Holy Spirit, which is given to us through Christ, we're given repentance from the elemental or the rudimentary things. And that elemental or rudimentary things in religion is the ABCs of religion. That's what men tell you. Well, you dress this way, and this will be your salvation. You come here, and this will be your salvation. You get that candle and you burn it, and that'll be your salvation. And you do this thing, or you do that thing, and that'll be your salvation. Those are the ABCs of religion. That's what the Jews did under the law, and that's what, what the pagans did in their pagan religion, in their idolatry. By bowing down and worshiping stumps and stones and sticks and doing this thing or that thing, they're the ABCs of religion. But Christ has turned us from that. He's given us his spirit, and by his spirit, we see those things do not save. It's not what I have or have not done. And we're turned from it. We're given repentance from dead works and turn to the living God. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Believing him, resting him, resting in him, trusting that he's our salvation. And so that's what occurred when Christ died and we died with him, that body of sin and all its folly and all its darkness was put away from us so that Christ is the hope of the child of God alone. And so Christ's death is a glorious salvation for us because he gave life. He put to death that body of sin and he gives eternal life to his child. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. We were going the course of the world. We were doing wicked works, thinking that it was our salvation, and Christ took us out of that broad way that leadeth to destruction and put us into the narrow way that gives us life and salvation in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at Colossians 3. Turn over to Colossians 3, because Paul speaks of what has occurred now that we are dead with Christ. Colossians 3, and verse 1, 1 through 3. He said, if ye then be risen with Christ, right, if we died with Christ, and we've been raised with Christ, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And so we died with Christ when he was crucified on the tree and our redemption was secured by him. He died bearing our sin and he put away our sin, that original sin in Adam and all the works and sin that we've committed since then. It's all put away and our baptism when we, when we, when we are baptized it's a testimony of the faith that God has saved me, that God has delivered me in the Lord Jesus Christ through his death, through his burial, through his resurrection as my substitute. Christ died my death, being made a curse for me. He was buried, having put away my sin from ever being seen again. It's buried, it's put away by Christ. And just as we are buried, and that symbolism in baptism, when we go under the water, it pictures our death, it pictures our burial. Well, so it follows that we must come up out of that water. A picture of the life which is given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a symbol of our hope 
in Christ himself, that he is our life, that he has obtained our life. He has obtained our eternal justification. We've been given the gift of life by Christ, who is our very life. And to the glory of God, that life is begun in us right now by faith. You have that eternal life. He's given you his life. And it's not waiting for us to, to, to die and be with him then. It begins right now in the child of God by faith. That faith is the life that Christ has given to his child. And it begins now. So back in Romans 6. Romans 6, verses 4 and 5. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And so that's what the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished. It's put to death that body of sin that was in me, that kept me in darkness from the true and living God. It's put away the enmity that's in my flesh, and he has given his child newness of life right now. That walks by faith, being led of the Spirit, trusting the salvation of God, believing him, walking in obedience, in faith, even in baptism. Lord, what doth hinder me from being baptized? My hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's all my salvation. I have no other life. I have no other hope but Christ. What doth prevent me from being baptized right now? That's what he puts in our hearts. Romans 6, verse 6 and 7, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. And so baptism is a testimony of what Christ has already done for me, already wrought within me. That life that is already given to me, baptism follows that life. Baptism should never be done by anyone to be saved. It should never be done by anyone who hopes to be saved by something that they do. That's not what baptism, that's not that one who trusts their works and thinks baptism is their life, they're not to be baptized. That's not, you should not be baptized. If you're thinking that baptism is life, don't be baptized. You've not heard Christ yet. Hear Christ. Look to him. Thank God for salvation and mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and if he gives you faith in Christ to rest in him, then be baptized. What I'm saying is there's no virtue in baptism. God doesn't impart any grace to you for being baptized. Right? When Christ was, when that woman came and touched him who had the issue of blood all those years to be healed, Christ noted, he said, virtue hath gone out from me. But in baptism, there's no virtue. All our virtue, all our salvation is in and by the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no power, there's no special grace that's given to the sinner because they are baptized. Christ is all our salvation. He's all our blessings. He's, he's everything to the believer. There's no power or grace because one is baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Baptism follows faith. It follows the blessings of God. It's, it's what he works in his child, that obedience. It testifies, you that were baptized, it's a testimony of the hope that you have in Christ. That, that the, those dead things are put away. That Christ is your life. It's a testimony of the hope and faith that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. That he has accomplished my salvation. That I have the promises of God in and by him. He's done this work of grace in me. And therefore, I want to follow him in baptism. Because I believe him. I trust him. He's already obtained. He's done the work of salvation. And so, baptism is full of symbolism. 
full of the symbolism of Christ's gracious work in the heart of the sin, in the heart of that one whom he's already saved and done this work. The believer stands in Christ justified, confessing now, even before baptism, old things are put away. Behold, all things are become new. And we see things differently by the grace of his power in us, in delivering us from that body of sin and giving us life in himself by his Holy Spirit, regenerating us, giving us life, cleansing us with the blood of Christ. And so baptism is a picture. It's a beautiful picture. It's spoken of in Scripture that, that testifies of the great confidence the sinner has in Christ. That's why we preach the word. And, and faith is revealed in the heart through the preaching of the word of God. And because we have that faith, we follow Christ. We walk in Christ in obedience to him. So it's a symbol of what Christ has done. It's a, it's a, it's a picture of the faith he's worked in us. The apostle Paul tells us when Ananias came to him and, and baptized him. Turn over to Acts 22. Acts 22. In Acts 22, in verse 16, Ananias came in, and Paul's recounting of, of when the Lord saved him under the preaching of the word, under the preaching of the gospel. And he said, Ananias said to Paul, Acts 22, verse 16, he said, Arise, arise, Paul, get up and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But baptism doesn't wash away sins. Baptism doesn't wash away our sins. The blood of Christ washes away our sins. But when Paul was baptized, it's because Christ had washed away his sins. And it was a symbol. It's just showing a symbol that, that he trusted, he believed. Christ had washed away all his sins by his own blood. And you see that language. It's spoken of in, in the scriptures. There's symbolic language that speaks of what Christ has done for his child and him were baptized. And if you look actually in Acts 9, flip back to Acts chapter 9, and we'll read verses 17 and 18. It actually shows that, that Paul was enlightened. Paul was given life before he was baptized. Acts 9, 17. This is the account of when Ananias came. Later he was speaking of it, telling another what, what, had, what the Lord had done for him. Here it is when it happened, Acts 9, 17. And Ananias went his way. He was directed of the Lord to go to Paul and entered into the house and putting his hands on Paul said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes, as it had been, scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. And so there we see the order, that the Holy Spirit had regenerated him, had enlightened his eyes, that that made him to behold the salvation of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Then he arose, and he was baptized, a believer. It was after this testimony of Christ's grace in him that he got up and went and was baptized. And so, back in Matthew 28, according to the commission of our Lord to his church, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, our Lord says, All power is given unto me, in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Preach Christ crucified. Declare to them what he has done by the death of himself and that he has been raised again from the dead by the power of God. Then it follows baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded. Christ, we declare what, who Christ is and what he's accomplished, who we were, dead in trespasses and sins, and what he's done to save his people. Like Philip, 
were to preach Christ crucified to our hearers, to speak of his atoning death, to speak of his accomplishment, his salvation, the life which he works in his child. And that soul who is baptized, that you that, that are baptized, believe in the Lord, you're entitled. You're entitled to that good hope. You're entitled to that peace. Not because you were baptized. Not because you were baptized, but because Christ gave you life. Christ revealed faith in your hearts. And he moved you to ask, Lord, what doth hinder me? What prevents me from being baptized? Lord, let me be baptized, showing, testifying publicly that you've done this work in my heart. That's what he works in his child. And for you that have that faith in him, arise, be baptized, be baptized. And our Lord said this in another place, and I think it fits here. Rejoice, he said, not because you were baptized. Right? He was speaking of rejoice, not because devils obey your, your command to come out of them. That's not your rejoicing. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And you that are baptized, it's because he's given you faith. That's, it's the believers are baptized. It's because Christ has given you faith. And if he's given you faith, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Amen.